I hope you had a, a great week with God's blessings upon your life, your family. Today my topic is called A Beautiful Mind. A few years ago, I was having a headache and for weeks and weeks and weeks. I had no idea what was going on. And you know, you go to the pharmacy, you get some medicine, and you take those things, and it was not helping at all. It was worse and worse and worse. And I got so worried because I, you know, I don't know what's going on. We start thinking about a lot of stuff. So I went to the doctor. Uh, he prescribed me something. Didn't help. So after a few months, I came to him and I said, I still have this headache. It's every day. So he asked me, okay, we're going to, I want you to do a, a CAT scan. So I went to the doctor in, in this place and, you know, they put you in the machine and, you know, and you go in and out like, like a photocop, right? So they, <laughs> they photocop you. So uh, I feel... Uh, later, I, I went, uh, the doctor asked him to go to his office, and, and she, was, she was from Russia, and she was looking my brain, literally, she was looking my brain, and she used those words, oh, you have a beautiful brain, it's a beautiful brain, it's very, you know, what, it's beautiful brain, and I, I said, okay, what, what my beautiful brain has, you know, what's, what's going on? She had no, that is nothing here, you know, uh, I don't know what's going on, that, that, that is nothing. So yeah, she gave me some, some medicine and I took for a few weeks and, and then the pain just went away, you know, there is nothing there. When she used that expression, it is beautiful brain, whatever she was saying, that's, that's symmetric or whatever it is, she couldn't see my thoughts. She couldn't see what I really am. She couldn't see the times that sometimes I got anger. Sometimes I lose it. She doesn't see the things that is made my mind off. She only could see what she was able to see on this CAT scan. She couldn't see my mind. She couldn't see my thoughts. And I wonder sometimes, you know, about our brain, this, this beautiful thing that God gave to us. In everything that you are, everything that I am, it has to cross our minds. Every thought that you have, every actions that you have, everything that you do is going to cross your mind. The human brain is by far the most complex and highly organized structure of the body. Every move that you do has to go through your brain to your mind. Everything has to come from there. It says that our brain is only three pounds. You know, some people, they might have weight more, but you know, it's the average three pounds. It's more, you can storage more information than in the Library of Congress in all its 17 million volumes. Your capacity in your brain, your mind, in your thoughts. And talk about thoughts, that's going to be what I'm going to focus today about our brains, about our thoughts. National Science Foundation says that we can have between 12,000 thoughts to 50,000 thoughts per day. And I was trying to read more about, about this, and, and they, they, they don't get any conclusion. Some think that's way more than that. Some, od some other doctors, they say, no, it's because you, 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 you think the same thing more than once. And that's overloads of information in your brain, and, you know. But I, let's, let's say it's 12,000 thoughts per day. Let's say that that's what you do, you know. This. But one thing is for sure. This great amount of thoughts that you have is what you are or what you're going to become. The Bible says that you are what you think. For us, he thinks in his heart, so is he. If I think about something, that's why I'm going to become. And the science is proving more and more and more that you are what you think about it. If you think you are happy, you're happy, right? If you think you're happy, you're happy. 
Yesterday I was listening to a story about a guy that was on, on e, uh, December 31st. He was going to his home trying to catch a plane to go to his house and spend this time with his family. And, you know, it's year eve and he's rushing the airport and he got there, was calm, not many people on that day. And he said, okay, well, let me drink a coffee. He went to get his coffee. And now this lady came to him and said, how are you? What's your name? And he said, my name is so-and-so. And she started talking to him. Oh, you're going to spend the holidays with your family. And she was smiling. She was pleasant. She was giving him attention. And then she asked, what do you want? And he said what he wants, his coffee with some cream or whatever there. Uh, and, then, and then she said, she prepared the call for him and said, hey, besides that, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And she was so happy and she was always trying to make him happy in this conversation going on. And he was amazed at the, the, the type of attention she was giving to him. And then she, she, he was walking away, he got his coffee, and she said, hey, next time stop by, uh, stop by here, let's talk about it. I want to know how was your time with your family. And he was getting his coffee, okay, thank you. And he left the store, and then he had to go back, and he said to her, why is Year's Eve, why you are so happy, what's going on with you? And she said to him, she said these words, I choose to be happy today. Amen. When we decide to become something, we can become something. For the other way, if you say, I'm sad, then you are sad. So our minds, our thoughts is going to make us to be who we are. So in other words, these thoughts that we have is going to affect your whole life. It's going to affect your family, how you deal with your family, how you deal with your spouse, how you deal with your wife, how you deal with your son. It's going to affect you, the way you perceive your family, how you feed these thoughts about your family. If you start to look at your wife and start making some, you know, I don't, I don't like this, I don't like that, they all put these negative thoughts, guess what? Doesn't matter what she or he does, it's not going to be good enough because you are feeding that negative thought about your family, about your husband, or about your wife. You think about that you go to work, it says that in North America, about 60% of people, they, some, some figures, they say 86%, and some they say about, no, no, it's not that real, it's about 88, 60%, but whatever the figure is, is the majority of people, they don't like what they do, they don't like their job. So, and then you go to every time you go, every day you wake up, you're going to be working on that place in, and then for eight hours a day, nine hours a day, or ten hours a day with someone that you start putting your mind, I don't like my boss, I don't like my boss, I don't like, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy, uh, this guy is annoying, what he wants it again. And how you are going to feel about your boss? Because you are feeding these thoughts about him. Because at the end of the day, have you ever noticed People as annoying as they can be, they have always someone around them. That means they have friends, they have family, right? So that means they are not that annoying. You are perceiving that person annoying. And maybe some people, they are annoying. So this is life. I am annoying sometimes. And guess what? You two are annoying sometimes. We're all annoying sometimes. This is life. You know what I mean? Is that, no, you'll never annoy. Yeah, sometimes you're all annoying, right? So, but, but if you always are feeding these thoughts about someone, against someone, that's how it's going to be. If you have your friends, I mean, how your thoughts is going to be regarding your friends. You know, you have a group of friends, you say, well, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy, I don't like this girl, I don't like... It. You know, it's, it's yeah, it, and you think about the church. You know, the church is an amazing place that you come together once a week, you know, they worship together. If I start looking around and, and, and look at Terry and say, I don't like Terry, I don't like Terry, I don't like Terry, I don't, you know, what this guy is doing this, he's our head of deacons, I don't like him, I don't like How am I going to perceive with him? How am I going to treat him? If I'm saying and feed my thought against my leaders of the church, the elders, the deacons, the aconistes, and you know, we always have something about something. If you're always feeding that thought against someone, how are we going to perceive the people? In other words, you perceive others according to our thoughts. 
So our thoughts is powerful. Yes. Now, our thoughts are not only power regarding church, but also about God. How do you see God and who is God for you? When you commit seeing your life, who is God for you? When you are struggling, struggling your life regarding God, who is God for you? How do, do you approach God? If you think God is the one that is making a list about, you know, about your doings, you know, it's not going to be a good God for you in your mind. Now, if you think about him as a father that is always there for me, doesn't matter what. God is always there for me. Doesn't matter my mistakes. Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter my choices. He's always there for me. Not because he's agreeing with me, but because he loves me. You know, and when you have children, you know, that's, that's exactly what it is. You see your, your God in a different perspective. Doesn't matter what my kids are going to do. Doesn't matter how bad they might become in life. It doesn't matter. I will always love my kids. How you see God is going to change the way you, you do your spiritual life. Because your spiritual life every day, every time is, is related with God and the things about God. And the way you see Him, the way you think about God, the thoughts that you feed God in your mind, in your heart, that's how you're going to perceive who God is. It now has about choices because we all have choices in life. Every single day you have choices. You wake up in the morning and you're gonna, you choose to wear the kind of clothes you are wearing. You choose to eat what you ate. You choose to walk the way you walk. I mean, that's everything about is choice. The Bible talking about this, it says, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witnesses the choice you make all that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live and every choice that you make you are going to think about it before you know when you think about david it's not that the guy wake up woke up in the morning and say oh you know what this is a good day to commit adultery no he was feeding that thought about, about Bechiba. He was feeding, and, 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 and the Bible says that Bechiba was a wife of one of his, of his warriors. If you know in the Bible, it says that David he has 33 warriors, and among the warriors, Uriah was one of them. So he saw, he, this was a family that was in his house, that was in his parties, that was in his, in his, in his area. He knew it. It, he didn't wake up one day and say, oh, Bitsheba, oh, let's, you know. No, he was feeding that thought. So our mind then is, as a feed something, that's what it's going to become. In the book, Switch on Your Brain, the doc, Dr. Liv says, when you think, you build thoughts and this become physical substance in your brain. In other words, as much as you start thinking about something, I'm not going to get into details because of our time, but your brain, it separates and it's going to give you another set of thoughts. In other words, as more negatively you're thinking, more that thing is going to build up in your mind. And you are going to be that kind of person. As much as you think that there are our, our cells, you know that our cells divide and our cells build up and, and replicate and all that. So you start thinking about something and that thing's going to build up in your brain and you are going to be that kind of person. That's why some people, they are negative, so much, too much negative. Some people, they are positive and too much positive. Doesn't matter what it is, it's because you build up to be that way. So the good news is, we think what we are, that means we can become, in our mind, you can go back again. I'm going to talk a little bit more as we go today. So the second thing about your mind is you think about what you are exposed to. The thing that you spend your time looking at. The th things that you read. The things that you listen to others. Because sometimes we become negative because you listen to negative people. Sometimes we become certain kind of people because we are around people who are that way. So how, how you expose your life about music, about movies, about gossip, about whatever it is, is going to be what you are. You are going to become what you're supposed to. 
In the book Adventist Home, the author says, in this age of the world, there is an unprecedented rage for pleasure. Dissipation and reckless extravagance everywhere prevails. The multitudes are eager for what? For amusement. The mind, the, the what? The mind becomes what? And fruitless. Because it's not used to what? To meditation or discipline to what? To study. So I, he says the multitudes are eager for amusement. And listen, we bring this amusement type of mind in the church, don't we? We want to come to the church and be amused, right? We, we want our worship to be amused. We want our service to be amuse us. Uh, is, that, is that a word, amuse us? Whatever. You know, so we, <laughs> you know, we, we, we want, you want, you know, listen, we all are for excellence and, and, and we aim for that. However, when we come to worship God, we have, we have to understand that it's, there is a lot of things that we don't understand about worship. Let me throw this to you. It's not my talk today. The people of Israel, they walked with God for centuries. And they didn't have what we have. They didn't go to a church. They didn't have a special music. They didn't have singing here. For, mil for, for thousands of years, they didn't have... The temple, if I ask you the question, were they worshiping God before, yes or no? Of course they were. What kind of worship was that? We're going to get this in another sermon. So everyone. But, but, he, but here's my point. We, we, we want to be amused and, and, and we want always to be entertained. And this has to do about our mind, the way we think, the way we process things. So, and of course, we, we think about what we're going to be exposed to. And I could talk about so many things about this position, the things that we're exposing our minds and, that's in, in how bad this becomes our character, how bad it becomes our lives and the way we relate to others and to our family. But I choose today that about this topic right here to choose about pornography. And there is a reason for that. The science is saying today that pornography is an addiction. It's the same way people crave for drugs, for alcohol, for smoking, for marijuana, for cocaine, as the same type of reaction, chemical reaction that happens in your brain. People who are exposed into pornography, they also have that same reaction. It becomes an addiction. So you, you become what you're going to expose to. And of course, the relationship is ruined, the infidelity, those who are into pornography is 300% higher, you know, uh, the 56% of, of the divorce in the world. There is over 40 million Americans are regular, regular visitors to porno sites. There are around 42 million porn websites, which totals around 370 million pages of porn. The porn industry annual revenue is more than, listen to this, more than EFL, NBA, and MLB combined. It is also more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. 40% of families in the United States reported that the pornography is a problem in their home. 47%. Now look at this. 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to porn, and 94% of children will see porn by the age 14. So this is a really epidemic out there. And, and again, all those things start in little, little. You know, it's not, it, it start, you know, the things is building up, building up. And there are people today, they are slaves for these things. And when I see those stats that, you know, uh, uh, more than 50% of Americans' uh, household, in, 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 they are facing, they are having this addiction, they have this problem. It is also something that we have to think about. And this does not, this is not people, oh, because you go to the church, you are immune to that. No one is immune to what's, what's happening outside. That's why our thoughts, our minds is what control what we do, control what we're going to watch, control what we're going to put in front of us. As Adventists, we care for our body and we have the health message. But also we have to understand that our mind is a powerful thing that controls everything, controls all our actions. 
Let's take care of our brain. The Bible says all of us also lived among them at one time. It's talking about the Romans and, and all the, the things that they were, they were doing against God. And then Paul says, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, if following its desires and what? Its thoughts. Okay, Paul is saying, saying the craving of our sinful nature because we are sinners. We are sinners. And, and you know, the, 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 the thing about sinning is because it's gratific there is a gratification on that. That's why people sin. Of course, there is always choices. There is all things that are going to give you regret later. But at that moment, there is certain gratification. And Paul understands this. He said it's craving, gratifying the craving of our own sinful nature. It follows its desires and its thoughts. Also, in the book Mind, Character, and Personality, the author says, if you indulge in vain imaginations, Permitting your mind to dwell upon impure thoughts. What is dwelling? What is dwelling? You, you, you're thinking, right? You keep thinking about it. You are dwelling. You are dwelling on that. So, if impure thoughts, you are in a degree as guilty before God as if your thoughts are carried into action. All that prevents the action is the lack of what? Opportunity. Opportunity. So in other words, if you dwell your thoughts about something, so that's why Jesus, he expanded when he wasn't worth. If you look about a woman with lust in your heart, you are at sin against her. If you, if you kill someone in your heart, you know, hate in your heart, you are at commit, you know, you are at trans, commit uh, uh, against God, sin against God. So our thoughts, now what she's saying is even, now we are dwelling about that because do... That you, you, you sometimes you can avoid a thought crossing your mind. It's like you cannot avoid the birds to be around your head, but you can avoid they, you know, plant it there and do his, his thing over there. You know, you can avoid that. You know, but you, you cannot avoid, oh, the, the birds are flying around you. You cannot avoid that, but you can avoid them to be. So she's saying, dwelling your, your thoughts about this thing. So, Everything that we do, everything that we think, every actions that we have, everything that we are has to do about our thoughts, about our minds, every single thing. But the good thing is the Bible says this, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be what? Be transformed. How am I going to be transformed? By what? By the renewing of your mind. Oh, thank God, we can renew our minds. We can renew our minds. Although it's dark sometimes, although it's dirty, although we, we think things that we should not think, we do things we should not do. So the Bible says, I don't want you to be conformed to the world. I don't want you to think that this is the way to be. That's it. Don't, don't, don't worry about, I can have those thoughts, I can have those ideas, it doesn't matter. It does. So now Paul is saying, I want you to be transformed by the renewing. The question then, how do I renew my mind? How do I do that? How do I renew my mind? Sister, in the book, Testimonies for the Church, the author says, mind does what? Does what? Oh, look at this, look at this. Trained. Do not waver between right and wrong, as they really trembles in the wind, but as soon as matter come before them, they discern at once that principle is involved, and they instinctively choose the right without longly debating the matter. Amen. Daniel and his friends, when they went slave to Babylon, they were walking back. They're walking, not bad, they're walking to Babylon. And they were talking in the book Patriarch and Prophets. It says that they were talking and they knew that they were going to Babylon. And they knew everything about Babylon. They knew how bad it was. They knew what they were going to face. They knew everything. 
So the author says that they decided that they would be faithful when they get there. Amen. They didn't decide to be faithful before. They decide, uh, 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 when they were there, they decided to be faithful before. So when they got there, they knew what would come. So they would say, oh, here he comes, that kind of food. I already said that that kind of food I'm not going to eat. They decided in their mind before it happened. You know what's going to happen. You know the things around you. You know, you know the temptations that you face. You know your weakness in your heart, in your life, as I do mine. We all know the things that get us. We all know the thing that snares us. In Hebrew, Paul says, the sin that snares you. The word is the sin. He's not saying sins. He's saying sin, singular. You know, he knows what gets us. So, so now, if I, if I prepare my heart, my mind, my thoughts against it, when I have that in front of me, I know because that's, this plate, listen to this, the plate is going to be served in front of you. But if you decide before not to have it, then you don't have it. So the word his is trained. You have to train your mind. You train your body physically. We do some exercise. We do all that stuff. Tomorrow there's exercise in the church. Ken is going to teach us to be uh, muscle and all that stuff with our body. Whatever's going to happen tomorrow will come. So anyway, so, but, uh, but here's, here's the thing. We train our mind. You have to train your mind to be able to do, to be transformed. The book of Colossians 2, chapter 3, the author says, set your minds, what you have to do? Set. Set your minds on things where? Above, not on earthly things. Set your mind. Put your mind in those things that is good. Put your mind in those things. Set your mind. Nobody in the world is going to set your mind for you. Nobody is going to set your mind for you. It's up to you. You have to do that. And Paul then says these beautiful words, finally, brothers, finally, whatever is what? Is true, whatever is noble, <clears throat> whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such a thing. Think about it. Whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, think about those things. You decide how you live your life. You decide how you're going to think. That's why it's the power of choice when God put Adam and Eve, gave, gave them choices, and the choices we have in front of us every single day. If you dwell in your thoughts to be a negative person, that never is going to happen. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. What, what's going to happen? It's not going to work. If you think about your spiritual life, no, no, this is not going to happen. This is going to happen. What's going to happen? Nothing is going to happen. That is, God gave us this brain and the power of choice that we can choose how we're going to live our lives. And that's why people, they do stuff, and some people, they don't do stuff, because they decide that not, they don't want to do and that's why the power of mind to do things and, and, and to think about good stuff. And, and Paul says, think about this thing. Think what you want. Think, think. Because at the end of the day, not only you have the power of choice and think about good stuff, you have God at your side every single day. There is one thing, listen to this, there is one thing that you cannot do in your life. You cannot sing and pray at the same time. Those, those things doesn't work together. It doesn't do good together. Now, when you have temptation in front of you, it might be in front of your computer, it might be in your office, work with someone, whatever it is. If you kneel down, Satan has no power over you. That it is no way that you are going to sing while you are praying. You know what I mean? It's, those things doesn't go well, doesn't go together. I mean, if you are facing your temptation, if you kneel down, say, Lord, you know my heart. I, I'm, I'm going to do this again, or I'm going to, you know, have this habit that's, Paul says, think about the good stuff. Renew your mind. And then you pray to God, and God will send his angels. You know how powerful is our mind? I don't know how many of you like panda. You know, I want you to think about the panda for this moment. You know, that you are playing with the panda, that you are having good time with the panda. You know, they are so, so cute. You know, have you seen these videos about panda? 
Uh, it, it's just, um, I, lo I love those, those, those animals. And I never touch one of them, but it's my, my dream one of these days. I don't know when, but you know, they are so, so cute. I want you to think about panda, right? Think about panda. <coughs> so now I want you to stop thinking about panda, right? So don't think about panda. Don't, don't think about panda. <laughs> Stop thinking about pandas. The reason your mind goes off panda when we start looking another picture and thinking about the horse with his head on the tree. And as you think up and see the picture, now your panda is going away in your mind. So the science called this thing the law of concentration and the law of substitution. So the law of concentration, the science tells us that in the law of concentration, they tell us that whatever we dwell on grows in our life experience. It becomes what? Part of us. This is science. If you don't, you know, if, if we can talk about this with outside. This is science. Okay, so the science says if you concentrate about something and you put your mind on that thing, that's going to grow in your experience. That's going to be part of you. It's going to grow in you. Okay, so because you are dwelling your mind about that thing, that's going to grow in you. Think about all the negative things that happen in your life. Because you are thinking about that stuff, and that's going to become part of our lives. It can be anything. Again, the way you see your family, the way you see church, the way you see people, the way you go to your workplace, whatever it is, it grows in you because you are concentrating on that thing, on that stuff. You are looking at this, and that's going to grow you. That's science. That's what happens in your brain. So the also beautiful thing that the science tells us is in the law of substitution, they tell us that our conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time, and you can substitute the positive thought for a negative thought and vice versa. So you cannot think about two things at the same time, right? As fast as you can go with your thoughts, you can think about panda and, and horse, panda and horse. I mean, at the time you said horse, the panda has, it can be, you know, fast, but you cannot have panda and horse at the same time crossing your thoughts. As fast as it can go, they are going to be uh, crossing each other. Now, the law of substitution tells <clears throat> that you can substitute your thoughts, whatever it is, and thank God for that. Whatever it is, whatever thoughts you have that you are growing on you, because the science tells you, you have thoughts in your mind that becomes who you are. You don't, don't wake up in the morning and become a negative person. I don't wake up in the morning and become a negative person. It's little by little that grows on me, grows on me. I thought, thought about that. And my brain starts capturing those negative thoughts, capturing, capturing it. And then I have, I'm exposed to things, exposed on the computer, exposed on the news, exposed with, with people that are negative. And I expose it to all these things. And I start feeding my mind with these things. And they become part of me. So the science also tells them that, okay, uh, you can substitute that. <clears throat> the doctor, <clears throat> Dr. Lee, in, his, in her book, book uh, Switch, on, Switch on Brain, she says, as we think, we change the physical nature of our brain. Listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. As we think, we change the physical nature of our brain. As we consciously direct our thinking, we can wire our toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with health thoughts. The science tells us that I can change the way I think, and when I change it, that thinking becomes part of me. This is exactly what Paul said. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about 
such a thing. The science tells us, let's substitute your thoughts. Paul says, yes, let's do it. Think about good stuff. Change your mind. Change your negativity. Think, change the way you see stuff. You will never going to work for things that you don't believe for. When we start building up and, 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 and the, the center of influence and... Uh, we really don't care, and we are telling the teachers they're going to be part of it. We don't care if we have one person coming. We don't care how many is going to come. I don't care if, he, if, if my class I'm going to teach is going to have one person there. I'm going to give that class for one person if you have ten persons, because at the end of the day, I decided to change one people, person's life than doing nothing for everybody. And that thought that you have in your mind, that cross, I'm going to do something. I believe what I'm going to do. Because you can do something. It's not about how many people are coming. It's about who you are serving. It can be one person. I'm going to serve that one person. The power of our mind is is. I mean, if you think something's not going to work, it's not going to work. For me, things doesn't work when I try and try and try harder for them. Then I can tell you that that doesn't, doesn't work. To them, the, you decide how you're going to live your life. Paul then finally, he says these words, we take, listen to this, we take captive every thought to make it Obedient to Christ. Every thought that you have, the good one, the bad one, every thought that you have, and make it obedient to Christ. Now, the word thought here is noema, and noema has to do about your thoughts, the way that you think, but also, in Greek word, has to do about thought and purpose, evil purpose. If you have an evil purpose in your mind, evil purpose in your thoughts, evil purpose about what you're going to think, the things that you say about someone, about somebody, evil about what you're going to watch on TV, evil, evil thoughts, evil purpose in your mind. Paul is saying to us, I want you to get your thoughts, I want you to get your purpose mind, your evil thoughts, and make it obedient to Christ. And you can do that, I can do that. The choices that we have in front of us. And how beautiful it is if we're walking in this way that we know that God can change my thoughts. And my thoughts are going to change who I am. Listen, the way the Holy Spirit works in our minds is in our brain. He works every single day. Since you and I were born, He works in our brain, works in our mind. Along the way, we choose to be getting stuff in our mind, and going to the other side. We choose to be negative. We choose to dwell on things that's not a big deal, but we, we dwelling on this stuff. It's, you know, as a pastor, sometimes I, I look, what's the, what's the deal on this? You know, but, but we dwell on stuff. We dwell on things. In the much as dwell on things that's become part of who I am, that's why Paul is saying, I want you to get everything that you have in your thoughts, the good ones, the bad ones, your evil purpose, and I want you to make it obedient to Christ. Because Christ is the one that's going to help us to become more like him. If you want to seek God's character, if you want to reflect God's character, we have to renew our minds, renew our thoughts. And then when I come to church, I look at everybody as a big family. And that word family in the church is the most misunderstanding word ever in a church setting. What happens in families? What happens in families? I have my family here, Terry, it's part of my family. That's why I'm losing her. So no, I, <laughs> part of my family. So what happens in family? You get along with family all the time? Oh, you all love your family. You always have everything good and good with your family. Is that what happened? No. Right? So you fight with your family, don't you? You say things that you regret later, don't you? How many times you have to ask uh, uh, forgiveness for your family? I have to tell you 
I, I forget how many times I mess up with my kids and I, I call them to the room, you know, with the face like, sorry, I, I mess up with you. Many times, my, my, my daughters would tell you, I, many times I, I told my kids, forgive me, I mess up with you. You know what I said, what I did, or, you know, I mess up with you. How many times I, 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 I fight with my, my kids, my brothers, with my mom and my dad, how many discussions we have. You know why we do that? Because we are family. The most misunderstood word in the church is family. Because when people fight in the church, they don't come back. Oh, I fight with someone. I'm gone. I thought this was my family. Hey, hello, this is your family. That's why we're fighting. <laughs> you don't fight with a stranger, do you? Most of our fights in life are with families, aren't they? Church is a family. If you learn this, that family, this is what family means, that sometimes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say things that I should not say, I'm going to behave in a way that I should not behave, I'm going to do things that I not should do, but then we see each other as a family. That means you and I, we are not perfect. At the end of the day, we're all messed up. But the beautiful thing about this is what Paul is saying to us. Take every thought, every single one of them, and make it captive to Christ. It's a choice that you and I, we have every day. That we can have my thoughts, my ideas, and make it captive to Christ. We don't need to have our thoughts run wild and think about wild stuff. We can take it captive to Christ. And then wake up in the morning every single day, you tell yourself, I'm going to see my boss today. He's annoying, but I got to love this guy. And you go with that spirit that you have to work eight hours a day with people that maybe you don't get along with. But then you start having a little conversation with them because you are changing your mind. And when you allow people to enter into each other's life, you see that the things, the appearance, the, you know, the things that you only see it really doesn't matter. I don't like formalities. It's in my personality. I don't like formalities. I hate Thai, but I use because I think is I can do this sometimes. <laughs> we like formalities. When the Bible expressed to us that to have joy because you have a savior. And this has to do about our mind. How we see God, how great he died on the cross for me. I mean, that's the most joyful thing I could ever hear in my life. Someone die on my place. So Paul is saying, get all, all, your, <clears throat> all your thoughts so all, and bring it to Christ. Make it, make it, make it, make it. Obedient, obedient obedient to Christ. Yeah. And when we see each other in our failures, in our, our life, in things that we do, we continue to look at each other as a family. And sometimes we don't get along, sometimes we fight, sometimes we say things that we shouldn't say, but that's family. The problem, listen to this, I'm going to end with this. The problem is not the thoughts that cross your mind. The problem is when we, I dwell on things and I keep my mind feeding that stuff. Wake up four o'clock in the morning. Ah, oh, think about someone. If the person is sleeping her home nicely <laughs> and you are there, oh my goodness, look at what happened. Paul says, bring a captive your thoughts to Christ. 
let, let me tell you this. <coughs> it's only worth to be wake up in the night when you want to do good for God's kingdom. Then wake up in the night. Think about your church, your family, your members, how, how you can inspire the people to do something good. That is worth it to wake up during the night. Not to sleep because you're thinking about someone is not worth it. That's why Paul said, thinking about the good stuff and make it your thoughts obedient to Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, you are our salvation. And we come before you and have just one request today. Please help us to the power of the Holy Spirit that we can renew our minds every single day. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.